should get started. So uh, welcome back. So now we continue with a presentation from uh, Selenium, and the speaker uh, the speaker is uh, Johannes Bagnoli, and he'll be talking about uh, nanoscale omic solutions with high accuracy. Thank you so much. Please take it away. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Today I would like to present you our nanoscale omic solutions, um, as mentioned before. And but first of all, um, I would like to introduce you to Selenium, because I guess most people don't know Selenium. So we are based in France in Lyon, so pretty much south uh, of, of France, but not at the coast. Um, and we are part of the Baiko Group, which is uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a big group, uh, which comprises over 13 different companies all over the world with uh, over 35 offices and over 1,000 employees. So within the group, there are many different companies, obviously, and they have slightly different business areas, including bioprinting. Most uh, famously, I think, is selling for that. Um, then bioscience with Cytina, which is also here um, at this conference, and us in the bioautomation together with our um, mother company from Germany, which is Sanyo. All right, so our mission at Selenium is to provide disruptive technologies, products and services to better understand cell biology, or to make our customers being able to better understand cell biology and therefore maybe have a better future for us all. And how we're going to do that is essentially very simple. Everything is based on um, a certain technique where we base our machines on, and our two major machines are the Selen one and the Sphero one. And what they do is essentially isolation of particles of any size. And by any size, I mean from 0.5 microns to a few hundred microns. And the major difference between the two machines, the Selen one and the Sphero one, is essentially the size range that they have. So the Sphero one is particularly designed for spheroids, organoids, and tumoroids, meaning that it can isolate uh, bigger, fragment, uh, bigger particles from 50 to 600 microns, while the Selen one is specifically designed to isolate very small particles from 0.5 to 80 microns, making it possible to isolate not only single cells from mammalian uh, source, but also um, nuclei, bacteria, spores, and whatever you find essentially in nature. But it's also capable of being used with very large cells like for example the cardiomyocytes. And there's a certain overlap here, but in general the Selen one is a kind of the more versatile version of that and the Sphero one is the more specified version of that. So in addition to the machines, we also um, focus on downstream applications for the machines. So um, with that, we mainly focus on nano well technologies. Um, so essentially, we provide two different kinds of chip. One is called the Selen chip, one the Proteo chip, which uh, make it possible to either create um, nanoscale libraries for next generation sequencing for the Selen chip, or nanoscale libraries for single cell proteomics um, with the Proteo chip, which makes absolute sense. So. To get a little more in more detail, I will solely focus on the cell and one today um, because uh, it's more um, yeah, relevant for, for essentially single cell omic solution than the Sphero one. And I would like to present you how it works. So the cell and one is not a simple machine um, which can do just one thing. It's a very versatile machine. And then generally, it's um, a combination of two different um, capabilities, which is the single cell sorting and isolation and the nano dispensing. So we can not only isolate certain um, cells of, um, or nuclei or whatever you want, we can also directly uh, put liquids into any kind of um, target, not only chips, but anything that you normally use in the lab. So the major features of the cell in one is that you get a 100% single cell um, accuracy and that does not only mean that you're 1% sure that you have a single cell, but in addition, you can be 1% sure to get everything from the sample. So meaning that if you have one cell in your sample, it's in 
theory possible to get this, this specific cell out of, for example, uh, when it's together with some other cells that you're actually not interested in. In addition, it's um, using not only bright field, but also fluorescent imaging. And we actually record all the images. So you don't get only what you get from a fax sorter, for example, that a certain parameters like size or granularity or something like that, but you get really a microscopic image that you can track down, essentially, at the end of whatever experiment you want to do. You can go back to the actual cell and look, okay, the cell looked very nice or the cell did not look very nice to whatever, for whatever reason. In addition to that, um, we also have a incorporation possibility with class two biosafety. And what is very important to understand is that due to the isolation technique that I'm gonna explain on the next slides, we have the best clonal outgrowth rate that is essentially possible. Meaning that how we isolate the cells is very, very gently. So we do not put any stress on the cells, which is for some cells super important, other cells are, don't care so much, obviously. But this is the major feature, essentially. All right, so how is the technology working? In principle, we use a glass capillary, which you can see here, this is just the tip of the glass capillary, which um, provides kind of droplet formation at the very, very end um, due to piezoacoustic techniques that you have an actuator, essentially a, a circular actuator right here, which is then providing uh, essentially a shock wave, which then leads to the ejection of a drop. So this drop is super stable, meaning that it's always the same size concerning the volume, and it's also the same trajectory all the time, and it's also um, having, yeah, it's uh, the same shape. So it's super stable. That's why we can not only isolate a single particle within this simple drop, but we can also use it for nano dispensing. So the size of the actual drop that's coming out here is in a few hundred picoliter area. In addition to that, as I mentioned before, we can, since this is glass, we can actually see ex through it, and therefore we can see any particles that are inside. That's not really working. All right, so um, to give you a better understanding um, of this rather complex machine, um, here's a little video. So we have two different, or two targets, um, where you can essentially conveniently use everything that you normally use in the lab. Of course, our own technologies like cell and chip, but also any MTP-based plate like the 96 well plate or 384 well plate. In addition, these uh, targets are cooled or, um, or can be heated actually uh, to avoid any evaporation or degradation of the sample. Then with this, uh, we call it actually the PDC, so with this uh, glass capillary mounted to a um, an automated arm, we can take up any sample. In this case, uh, we can see here um, some cells being taken up from a simple tube. And then we have essentially two volumes. So first is the ejection, and then the sen sedimentation, I'm sorry, uh, zone, which is essentially like a safety barrier. And we know that whatever is in this area will become the drop that is generated afterwards. So if we have a single cell, we can then, using the robotic arm, go to our target and dispense the single cell into the target. Now, what is very important, very often you don't get any cell within this zone, or you sometimes also get two cells, which we will see uh, right now. And what happens then is we do not waste them. We essentially put them into a tube, which is directly under the camera station, so that if you have very, very rare cells, you can actually put it up again into the nozzle and therefore get 100% of your cells out. And we record all the parameters like uh, size, shape, and the actual pictures, as you can see here, on the hard drive of the machine. So you can always go back. So let's see the, how that looks in real, like in the, with real cells, so you can see down here how we isolate, I think it's HEK cells in this uh, example, and how we essentially go from the microscope um, image system to our target, in this um, case, a 96 well plate. Oh, come on. 
Okay. So in addition, we also use fluorescent, we can use fluorescent stainings using four different channels, um, namely blue, green, uh, red, and orange. So we can also integrate, for example, live dead stainings or um, certain stainings for um, surface markers. That's not, not a problem. And we ac acquire the images kind of serial. So you, f for example, can do first um, a normal bright field image where you select, for example, a certain um, particles because of the size. And then we can al um, also make pictures for each of the channel, how, depending on how you set up the machine. And that way we can also, uh, yeah, for example, distinguish dead cells. And the speed that's depicted here is just, uh, well, it's a slow motion 10 times, so it's actually pretty fast. So yeah, with this, um, we are able to isolate any kind of uh, particles, as mentioned before, and we do not require any minimum input. So if you have just one microliter of your sample, that's totally fine for us. And we also need only one cell. So this is obviously a very solid platform to, um, for many different applications uh, throughout biology. Um, for example, cell line development based on um, CRISPR-Cas, um, but also um, stem cell and iPSC development, and obviously also perfectly suited for omic solutions. And what I would like to uh, mention very briefly is the machine is very versatile. So that means that if you have a certain protocol to develop, you can do that. We don't um, inhibit essentially any research going on. So let's focus now on the omic solutions, which is the Salon chip and the protein chip. So the Salon chip um, 384 is uh, a nano weld chip, which is made of low binding polypropylene and it has very, a very unique uh, well shape, which is perfectly suited um, for the nano um, volumes and also is perfectly suited to have any kind of liquid. So and no matter how viscous it is or something like that, it essentially inhibits any abnormal behavior of the liquid to, um, for example, edge effects or something like that. It's in the format of a normal microscopic slide. So um, since it's also very, um, well, very clear polypropylene, you can also take images after uh, you isolated something. Um, the working volumes uh, range from 20 to 500 nanoliters, and as I said before, you have two targets on the, on the Salon 1, so you can have up to eight chips on the Salon 1 in one experiment, or in one run. Um, since it's a very special kind of format, which is not uh, normally used in omic solutions, uh, we also provide all the adapters that are necessary to, for example, do centrifugations or recovery of the liquid. So, for example, you can recover the liquid that is in here via centrifugation um, top down, and then re um, kind of collect the liquid in what we call a funnel. And then you can just easily pipe that out. And based on the system, um, we have uh, recently launched our first essential kit, which is a three prime RNA sequencing kit, uh, giving the user the capability of isolating cells and do all the necessary steps until the sequenceable library. And for that, I would like to briefly um, mention how it works and what the focus is. So the focus here is that the user can 100% um, have the, its con uh, his concentration on the isolation of the cells and the preparation of the sample because we think that is that is something that many people ignore how important that is. Um, however, it's really really important for transcriptomics. So what we provide is not only the chip, but we provide the chip which is already pre-barcoded, so with barcoded oligo DT primers and has everything in that for um, re reverse transcription and lysis of the cells. So you just need to put it from the freezer to the cell in one and start isolating your cells. Afterwards, uh, so after the reverse transcription, we use a method that most of our competitors also do. So we do uh, pooling and then further steps um, until the sequenceable library, essentially everything from amplification 
and library preparation is done in a single tube parachip. And this is a very simple and easy workflow, um, so it doesn't put any stress and it's pretty fast and we use a, also a custom library preparation um, which uh, does not in, uh, kind of have any problems, for example, with index hopping. So when we compare our RNA sequencing to other competitors or methods that are out there, it's obviously very complicated to do that because there are, first of all, a lot of different methods. Um, second of all, it's a very complex data, which has very um, a lot of different parameters. So what we did is we collected um, what we think are the most important uh, parameters, for example, the number of genes, um, the mapping rate, um, and for example, also the RNA fraction or the dropout rate, and combined it into a single performance score for easier visualization, essentially. So when we did that, we could see that we essentially outperform um, um, the competitor solutions on the market, um, and we were on par with the most sensitive solutions that are known um, in the academic field, namely SmartSeq2 and um, the very new SmartSeq3. And as a little example, I would like to show you um, a short yeah, kind of experiment that we do a short uh, that we did a short study, where we compared um, the two different culture methods, 2D and 3D, uh, for HEPA or G cells. So what is known is that these um, this liver cell line uh, resembles more um, the actual liver function when they are cultured in a 3D uh, spheroid than actually in a 2D culture, and we wanted to see if we can actually uh, see that in our transcriptomic data. And unsurprisingly, um, we can definitely see that, and we also saw a very interesting effect. So while the 2D culture cells and the, um, a part of the 3D culture cells show a very um, um, similar transcriptomic uh, uh, transcriptome um, here depicted in cluster one um, using unsupervised clustering, um, we could see that there is another cluster which is only coming from the 3D culture, which is slightly different. And in addition, there's a third cluster, which is um, also coming from the 3D culture and is um, essentially characterized by apoptotic markers. So what we think happened here is that in the center of the spheroid, where nutritions are very low, the cells start dying because they don't have enough sugar and something like that. So what is the difference here now between cluster one and cluster two? So the difference is, that in cluster two, so coming from the 3D culture, we have an overexpression um, of uh, hepatic um, marker genes, for example, albanine and FGG, meaning that we can essentially see this more realistic, um, uh, yeah, realistic phenotype of the 3D culture with our kit. Sorry. So single cell RNA sequencing is the major topic nowadays, or it has been at least for the last five years. However, it doesn't represent what is actually going on with the cell right now. It's a little bit of a look in the future, because what is actually going on right now, that's what the proteins do. So we think that single cell proteomics will be at one point the major thing that people will look at if the technologies are capable of doing that, because right now they are not. Um, due to technical limitations, for example, in um, kind of sequencing of proteins. Um, so we wanted to contribute to that um, in collaboration with the IMP in Vienna, um, and that's where the Proteo chip comes into play. So the Proteo chip is similar as the Selen chip. It's a bit different, so made from a different material, and it also looks a bit different based on the technical limitations. So what we have here is we have 12 arrays, which are, um, have each 16 wells, and they're um, perfectly suited for team T peptide labeling either 11 plaques or 16 plaques. And you can have up to three proteo chips on a single run, making, you, uh, making it possible to have just shy of 600 single cells. Uh, the workflow is again very similar and driven by the same idea as single cell RNA sequencing, meaning that we want to focus uh, primarily on cell isolation. 
So what we provide again a filled chip and the customer can completely focus on the things, the isolation. Uh, Lysis is performed on deck on the cell in one um, as we have temperature control of the target. And then the TMT labeling is performed also with the cell in one, so using not the cell dispensing, but the um, liquid dispensing capabilities in an automated fashion. And what is very important also is that we have a similar idea using a funnel for liquid recovery. This funnel is, however, um, designed to work directly with the auto sampler. So you do not have another uh, tube in between where you can lose your proteins, which is very important. So with this system, um, we, have, uh, so we have a multiplex proteomic system here. Uh, we, have, um, we have no evaporation issues, even though we have very low amounts of volume in there. And as we have no while exchange throughout the whole process, because it's just adding on liquid uh, at this point especially, um, we do not uh, have any problems with proteins binding to the surface of any kind of plastic. And this is very important and explains why our data looks like our data looks like, which is that we have a very high sensitivity with up to 1,400 proteins per single cell and, and an outstanding signal to uh, noise ratio, even with no carrier channel. And with that, we are actually the first ones, together with uh, the um, people in Vienna, obviously, to demonstrate this multiplexing the proteomic approach without the carrier channel. I would like to mention um, them, especially, uh, so the group of Karl Mechtler, uh, which did a great job together with us uh, to develop this. And I would like to also to mention that we work uh, with people here in, in the US, uh, for example, Nikolai Slavov here in Boston, but also with people at the PNNL in Washington State for further proteomics uh, solutions. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Um, that is highly dependent actually on the mass spec and the library that you use, so um, we don't have essentially a complete uh, influence on that. But I've seen data with um, more than 2,000 okay. um, proteins. So the protein is identified using mass spectrometry. I see. So you have to, inter it's not in the machine. No, it's, that's not in the machine. Oh, we I just see. create essentially the library, and that's uh -huh. why we also don't have any influence on the actual, um, yeah, kind of how many proteins you detect, because that's, um, well, that's essentially based on how you operate the, the mass spec, which has a huge influence, and also on the library that you compare it to. Similar as you do when you do omics, um, so for example, any sequencing. If you have a better annotated genome, you will get more genes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. you might have shown it, but maybe I missed it. This is compatible with all the latest TMT capability, meaning that you're up, all the way up to that TMT 18 for the labeling for the, the section. I think we have uh, possibility is 16 plaques. That's, uh, so 18 plex, I don't yeah. think. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert for uh, the proteomics. Um, but you can do up to 8,000. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm not in the sales department, so uh, <laughs> I actually don't know the exact price. Um, it's definitely more than, I don't know, than a normal person gets a day. <laughs> Or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> More questions? Oh.
Okay, if not, we have a lunch break. Yay! So, um, we have a lunch break for an hour, so it starts at 2.30.